I'm making stays, yay! Stays are the precursor to the bra and the precursor to the corset. They were used in the 18th century to provide bust support, back support, support for layers of petticoats, as well as providing the basis for the fashionable silhouette of the era. Throughout most of the 18th century, the cone shape was in fashion. The stays were smaller at the waist and bigger at the bust, but the stays were mostly straight up and down, though the pattern pieces themselves were not cut on a straight lines. In the 1780s, the proud front shape became popular, meaning the bust of the stays became more prominent. Towards the end of the 1790s, bust gores and gathered cups started showing up in stays, giving the torso a softer and more natural shape. There's a free Foundations Revealed article by Wendy Wildermoth about the changes in stays from 1790s to the 1820s. Of the 12 1790 stays in her sample, one pair had U-shaped cups, and one pair had a single V-shaped gore per side. Double gores became popular later, during the Regency. I have decided to make my stays with a single bust gore per side, since I don't really like the look of the gathered cups. It just seems like they add unnecessary bulk. So bust gore it is! I'm going to be using the book Patterns of Fashion 5, which is the love of my life. It is a book released by the School of Historical Dress about the content, cut, construction, and context of bodies, stays, hoops, and rumps from circa 1595 to 1795. It is a book with lots of patterns of stays and hoops. And I will be making 1790 stays for my 1790s project to go with my 1790s shift. Now there is a pair of 1790 stays in this book, however, it's only made up of two pieces and uh, I don't like that amount of shaping. I think I need some more shaping. Now, more experienced bloggers than I have said, which I will link below, that in the late 1790s when cups started to appear in stays, that people just took their 1780s and earlier 1790s stays and slipped gores into them. I'm going to be using this 1780s stays pattern, which I kind of like the shaping of, for a kind of 1780s, 1790s prow front shaped shape. And I will be using that and cut gores into them. And hopefully we will have late 1790s days. Book smell. The way this book works is there are patterns on a grid and you scale them up using the grid. It says here that each big square, meaning each group of four small squares equals an inch. So basically what we need to do is find inch gridded paper or half inch gridded paper and draw out these shapes in accordance with how they are spread out on the grid. There are a number of ways to scale up patterns from Patterns of Fashion. This is the way I do it. The patterns are on a half inch grid, so you just have to find an anchor point, a point that is on a corner of a square, for instance, point S on the front piece. And then once you find your anchor point, you just count squares out from there. So for instance, from S down to U is 22 and a half squares. And then from S down to T, which is the end point of the lacing, is 15 and a half squares. And then we have to start going outwards. So point B is two and a third squares out from the line we drew and 17 squares down. The point of the tab is one and a half squares up from U and three squares in. Point A is three and a half squares down from S and 15 and a half squares out. And then we go up. Point N is two and a half squares up from S and 15 and a third squares in. O is three and a third squares up from S and 13 and a half squares in. And then we just take a ruler and connect all those lines. For the curved lines, we need a French curve and we need to find anchor points for those two. So for instance, on the big side curve, there are points that cross the intersection of two lines, two up and one out from B and two and a half down and three and a half in from A. So after we have those anchor points on the curved lines, we just connect the dots with the French curve. And then we have our pattern piece. And then we just do the same thing with the other pieces. There are pieces that don't really have a straight line on the grid like the front piece did. And in that case, we have to measure the base and the height outside of the pattern piece. There's a bit of guesswork involved. Basically, if in doubt, just kind of see where the line goes in, in relation to whatever box you have on the grid. Oh, is it here in the, in the box? Is it here in the box? And then travel your line wherever dot it goes through in the box. So let's draw all that on paper and cut it out. And I drew out inch sized squares on this paper. I have a whole piece. This does not include seam allowance. So now what I have to do is I have to chew up the lines to make sure that these lines actually meet up because I copied it more or less from Patterns of Fashion, but you know, human error and whatnot. So I'm going to make sure that all the lines that need to match up actually match up. I'm measuring A to B on this piece and A to B on this piece. Okay, so it all meets up and we have six pattern pieces. In addition to the patterns, Patterns of Fashion also has a drafting guide for stays. Using what they call the arc method, you draw an arc shape for your bust line your waistline, your hip line, and the bottom of the tabs line, instead of drawing straight lines. You draw out those arcs and the length 
to your measurements. And then draw lines between the pattern pieces making the shape of the stays that you want. In the beginning of the book there's a very useful chapter about how people were measured for stays in the 18th century. So I took my measurements using that explanation, and now I will draft out a pattern using the arc method from the end of the book. And then I will use the 1780s pattern that I copied from Patterns of Fashion and try to make that pattern match my measurements. So let's see how this goes. And now I draft my stays. First I draw the side line which is drafted in the middle, and then the bust arc. I tried to do it with a bucket, but that yielded a too small arc, so I tried a different bucket. In the end I wound up just freehanding it. Now from the bust line to the waistline and draw an arc there. I had to redraw the bust and waist arc so many times until they were long enough and the angles matched my measurements. And now to make these arcs symmetrical, I fold the pattern in half on the side line, insert pins along the correct line, turn it over and copy that line onto the other side. I'm just making sure the bust line is half the circumference of my bust, that the front side is half the measurement of the front of my bust, and the back is half the measurement of the back of my bust. And the same thing for the waist. Half the whole waist circumference, half the front of the waist, and half the back of the waist. And now the diagonal measurement from the center back to the side waist. And to make that work, I'll have to redraw this bust arc again, and copy it to the other side with pins again. And to now draw out the center front line from the top to the bottom of the peak. And now the waist needs to be redrawn again, just making sure that waist measurement is still the same, and to measure to the end of the tabs. Now I measure up from the bust line to the armpit. And finally draw the center back line. And there we go, we have the bare bones of the pattern! And now I have to line up the pattern pieces from Patterns of Fashion in this grid that I drew to my measurements, and try to find where they need to sit. I kind of assumed that I would have to slash it to make it smaller, this, it seems I'd have to make it bigger, because if I would put these pieces together, like this, it is actually smaller than my body. I have this space and this space that my body needs to fit into. So I'm going to bring the farthest pieces out to where my body would need to sit. The back piece is very close in size to my back, lengthwise. The bust and waist line up fine. <laughs> I'm lining it up widthwise with the bust measurement, not the top of the stays. It'll lean slightly towards the center back on the top, because the center back has a slight curve here, so it'll be bigger up top and slightly smaller in the middle where it curves in. I lined the center front point up with the edge of the bust line, and the bottom of the arm side in this piece with the bust line too. I have heard that stays should come up about an inch or so higher than the bust line, however in this case I took this measurement at the top of the stays, not at the actual natural bust line. So I'm matching this piece up with the bust line as I drew it. This puts this pattern piece at a bit of an angle, widening the bottom of the piece at the center front. And now I'll figure out the placement of the top of the stays first, since the shape of the neckline seems to be more important than the way the tabs split apart. And I'm just spacing these pieces apart, putting the bottom of the arm say at the top of the stays line, and then spacing the rest of the pieces between them along that curve. And I'll draw out that line including this little v-shape between pieces 3 and 5. And now I'll draw the lines between the pieces. I've decided to round out the center front point of my stays, because in this pair of stays these points seem to not be boned, and I don't want it to be floppy. In this pair of 1790 stays in the book, the front point is rounded, so that's what I'll do for my stays. And I'm just continuing to draw these side seams. I'm just going to keep the space between the pieces the same as it was in the original pattern, and thus make the pieces themselves bigger. I'm going to treat these two pieces as one, because it says in the book that this piece was most probably an extension added after a fitting, because there's both no boning in this piece, and these two pieces meet up with no gap. So I'm going to treat them as one pattern piece and not draw a line between them. The sideline runs through piece number two over here, and now I'll just pull each pattern piece down to the waistline and draw the tabs. I'll draw a line to end the tabs at so they all become the same size and don't end at different places on the body. Each tab needs to be just bigger than a piece of boning, which in my case is nine millimeters, so I'll make each tab one and a half centimeters, and that should be big enough. And draw straight lines between the tabs to where I marked the slit between them on the waistline. Don't forget to mark the pattern pieces. One, two, three, four, and five. 
five pattern pieces instead of six since I joined those two small pattern pieces together. And of course, don't forget to label the pieces. 1790 stays, first try, because of course there are definitely going to be changes. I have my master draft here. Because there's a bit of overlap here and also because I don't want to lose this layout, I am not going to cut this up like this. I'm going to trace over each piece with a different piece of parchment paper. I'm cutting the center front piece out on the fold so that I'll have a whole piece and it'll be easier to copy it out onto the cardboard. And now I'll just cut out the other pieces. And because these are not double, I don't have to cut them on the fold and it's just much easier to just cut them out. Oh, my dears, the time has come to make a cardboard mock-up. A mock-up is a trial run of a garment to solve any fit issues you may have before spending a lot of time and money making an actual garment. In the case of stays, it's a good idea to make a cardboard mock-up even before the fabric mock-up because the cardboard itself behaves very much like finished boned stays and it's quite quick to make. All you have to do is rescue some cardboard boxes from the garbage, preferably before they get thrown out, copy the pattern onto the cardboard, don't forget to keep the grooves in the direction of the grain line, cut all the pieces out, and just stick them together with duct tape. The waistline is kind of not straight, but it dips in the middle, and that comes from drafting the waist on a curve. And this is the end of the curve, so it dips. I got my friend to help me stick it together because we, we really needed two pairs of hands, one person to hold the pieces together and another person to actually put the tape on and it made a pair of stays. I don't actually have video from that endeavor. I do have pictures, I'll put them up now. I'm so happy it worked. It was made with the measurements I had taken, so it fit. We put it on. Here you see. There was a bit of overlap in the back so we marked that out. We marked out this line. That's the amount of overlap I need to take out of the stays. So basically half of this on each side. In addition to that, we marked the width of the busk and the distance from there to the cup and the width of the cup and the length of the cup, which is basically to the under bust. We measured that and then we need to cut out cups. I'm going to cut out cups in this shape, kind of rounded. However, I'm not going to make this shape in the Stays. I'm going to, just going to make a slit in the stays until the underbust. We did fit the stays so that the bust was a little um, restricted, so that when we add cups it will give space. And that's probably why we have such a big overlap in the back. So I'm going to take the excess mostly out of the back pieces because the front pieces, the seam lines actually really line up to where I want them to be. And I'm going to try to not change piece number five. Piece number five is the back piece and while the instinct says to just take it out of there because that's where we want to make it smaller because that's where the lacing gap is so we're saying oh that's the piece I want to just cut it smaller but we can't really because um, there needs to be a lacing gap there and we need to have space for a bone a lacing strip and then another bone on the other side of that. All right, let's get to repatterning. Stay tuned for next time when I will adapt the changes from this cardboard mock-up for the pattern for the fabric mock-up and make a fabric mock-up. See you then. I'd love it if you could like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell to help my channel grow and reach new people. You can find me on Patreon, Instagram, and my blog. Bye for now.